In this video, we will look at the video pipeline at the top of the screen. This is the route that video takes through your processor before it reaches your LED panels. Think of the signal coming into your processor and moving from left to right before it reaches the panels. On the left hand side, you will have the inputs for your processor. On the SX40 I am using SDI and HDMI inputs which in this case I am using HDMI. If you want to switch between the inputs, simply double click on the input. Once you have chosen your video input, the signal reaches the inbuilt scaler. This allows you to shrink your content to the LED wall. There are a few options here, like snap to selection, where you can select your panels and automatically scale your input to the wall or snap to canvas that resets the scaler to the entire canvas. Next up is colour replace. A good example of this would be where you have a corporate logo which displays in the wrong colour on your wall. An example of this would be a screen at a car show where the perfect red sports car is in front of the screen but has an imperfect orange corporate logo on your wall because of the panels. Here is how you would fix it. Moving on we have 14 way colour correction which is similar to colour replace but rather than picking one colour it allows you to refine our selection over many colours. This can be handy if there is a certain colour in your content that appears differently on your panels, however everything else seems fine. Now on to curves. Adding to the chroma tune abilities of the SX40 and S8 is curves, which provides red, green and blue and white channels. This enables video levels for each colour channel to be manipulated by creating custom transfer curves. This may be used creatively to adjust the look of the video, for example adding an S-curve to add more contrast, or as a tool to fine tune the appearance of the screen for ambient viewing conditions or on-camera performance. We now move to the override section of the pipeline. If you think of this as a piece of paper being put over the top of your video content so you, you can either blank everything or use test patterns to test or troubleshoot any problems you are having with your wall. There is a default selection of test patterns but it's also possible to either take a freeze frame of the video input or upload your own logo either from a USB stick on your computer or plugged into the processor. If your processor has blackout and freeze buttons, you can change the behaviour of these buttons here. A good example of this would be to record the client's logo here, then if there is a problem with your video input to the processor, you can switch to the logo instead of just blanking out your screen. Freeze and blackout do exactly as it says, so there's not really any point in doing a detailed description of these. The final section of the pipeline is the output. This is where your actual panels are controlled, and also includes some of the redundancy options of the processor if you have multiple units in your setup. First of all is the colour buttons. Most of the sliders here are self-explanatory and we will be doing a separate video on dark magic at a later date. The brightness slider is used to control brightness at the panels, providing the best grayscale performance, but should not be used live as the panel update is not synchronised. Intensity gain is used to control the processor's output brightness and is limited by the network bitrate, but all panels will update simultaneously. 
Knowing when to use each one is important for getting the best low brightness performance. You should always set the brightness to the maximum that you would require for your show and then use the intensity gain to adjust during live performance. Just using the intensity gain slider will make you more susceptible to banding. We will cover this when we look at dark magic. Other features here are also Oscar, which we will cover in a video on its own. Next up is the network tab. You can change the bitrate of your panels here. You can also find the panel calculator in the description of this video, which explains this further. But basically, the more bits you have on your panels that are running, the less pixels you will be able to have per port. You can also set a delay on your input should you be using multiple processors with the same video input, and this is causing the video to tear. We will also cover the Genlock here, but again, this will be a video for a later date, but it's quite useful when this is being used with live cameras. Frame rate multiplication can be useful when your panels are being filmed by cameras and there is a flickering effect that's coming through the cameras. This enables the panels to run at a higher frequency than the shutter of the camera and avoid the problem of flicker. Finally in the network tab we have our cable redundancy options. We will cover this properly in another video but any of our processors apart from the T1 have the ability to do this. Port A out of our processors goes to the panels but when the last panel is reached, the cable is looped back to port B of the processor. If there was a break in this loop, a signal can then reach the rest of the panels from the other port on the processor. If enabling this feature, remember you will have to confirm this before it is enabled. The failover button is specific to the SX40, and if you had two processors, this is where you would configure your main and backup, and also the triggers which would allow the processors to switch over. Finally, we have live control. This is where the actions of your processors can be controlled over DMX, ArtNet or SACN. Alternatively, you can do this from the control application, which we will cover later. Hopefully this has given you an overview of the pipeline and how the video signal makes it from left to right on the processor. I will see you in the next video.